Cool. Uh -huh. Awesome. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Adam Rixtons, and I have the immense pleasure today of getting to speak with Jason Ananda Josephson Storm about his scholarship on metamodernism. Uh, currently, he holds the esteemed positions of professor and chair in the Department of Religion, as well as chair in Science and Technology Studies at Williams College. Additionally, he maintains affiliations with Asian Studies and Comparative Literature Departments at the same institution. Um, Storm's earlier research concentrates on Japanese religions, European intellectual history, and theory in religious studies. And with a portfolio, uh, portfolio is, uh, is compromising of uh, three books right now and over a dozen scholarly essays in the English language. Um, but Storm's academic contributions extend beyond just linguistic boundaries. His debut book titled The Invention of Religion in Japan garnered the esteemed 2013 Distinguished Book Award from the Society for the Scientific Study of Religion and was a finalist for the uh, Best First Book Award in the History of Religions category presented by the American Ex uh, Academy of Religion. Um, Storm's 2017 book, The Myth of Disenchantment, challenged the ideas of disenchantment in the social sciences and has also garnered fantastic praise. And today I'm here to discuss with him his 2021 book, Metamodernism, The Future of Theory, an absolutely groundbreaking text that sets up a whole new way to address meta uh, metamodernism with applicable theory. Um, so thank you so much for being here today, Jason. Uh, how are you doing? <laughs> I, I'm doing good. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you for that nice intro. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the academic accolades are very important. <laughs> so, all right, I'll start with the first question. So I want to begin by acknowledging the short and recent history of metamodernism. It's a very blooming movement right now. Um, so recently, uh, Timotheus Vermoulin and Robin Van Den Acker um, have pushed the terms popularity a lot, uh, particularly in their ideas of how it relates to modern art and media. Um, despite this, it seems that they are more concerned with metamodern aesthetics and you're more involved with application. Uh, so simply in your own terms, I guess, uh, with that background, what is your version of metamodernism? Sure. So I came to the term metamodernism kind of late after the book had already been mostly drafted. Um, and um, for me, um, what I was trying to do was find ways to work through postmodernism uh, in particular, but also what we could call modernism, um, or at least positivism in the humanities and social sciences. And I was hunting around, and my so my editor really uh, wanted me to have an ism for various reasons uh, after the peer review. The original title of the book had been Absolute Disruption, the Future of Theory. Um, and and was it, so people were... Um, wanted to know, you know, what camp am I in or whatever. And I remembered something that I had read, oh, many years earlier by a, a Nigerian art historian named Moyo Okadiji. And I had been in the process actually prepping a course on um, religion and diasporic art. And he had contributed to a volume on African and Jewish diasporic art. And I he used the term metamodernism in that work to describe artists who were trying to um, fracture, transform, um, work through, work beyond the categories of modernism and postmodernism. And he, he's an artist himself, and he included himself in that category. And I thought, you know, that's kind of what I want to do. I want to, or what I'm trying to do um, on the level of philosophy. Um, and so that's sort of how I got into the term. I looked at uh, Vermoulin and company's work on the, on the subject, but we're coming from really different lineages. We're using the term in very different ways, not necessarily in compatible ways, but we definitely have different motivations and different interests. So what do I mean by the term? Well, what I mean is more specifically, I'm trying to trigger a paradigm shift uh, in philosophy and in, the, in more broadly humanities and social sciences to replace uh, a now outdated body of theories we could call postmodernism. And they were called postmodernism not because uh, they reflected some vast zeitgeist or anything, but because uh, particularly they were anthologized together in a way that became an academic model or anti-model. Anyway, um, this became the dominant style of doing scholarship in, in uh, many humanities and social sciences, a dominant, at least, paradigm. And I want to provide a new paradigm that consolidates what was the best parts of postmodernism uh, while also working forward and, and escaping uh, some of its deficits. And the problem is, uh, from my perspective, postmodernism had some cool things into it, in it, but it uh, has developed um, its own pathologies and is producing diminishing returns. And so, by metamodernism, I mean to describe a systematic philosophical attempt to um, provide a new paradigm for the humanities and social sciences. Fantastic, yeah. And I want to go back. Um, so, Okadiji, you had also just recently done an interview with him. I want to plug that really quick. Is that available anywhere? Uh, yeah, you can find it on my academia.edu page. It also came out in the journal Religious Studies Review, but it's paywalled. So yeah, if you yeah. check out my academia.edu page, you can get a free um, 
I think it's up there for free. And if not, I'll put it up there uh, by the time this goes, uh, this interview goes up. But yeah, thank you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I read that. It was fantastic. It was really insightful, especially like how a kind of art had transitioned into that and that term came about. So that's all cool. Um, so leading off another point you made. So metamodernism is the solution or uh, I guess synthesis of modernism and po uh, postmodernism in a way. Um, in what capacities do you think modernism and postmodernism exist, if at all, anymore? Uh, because obviously, you know, we as a society have named them and been able to categorize them somewhat. Um, but to your point that you made um, in another interview that I remember, um, it can be hard to pinpoint like our cultural ruptures, like where each one starts and ends. Um, and you gave the example that Nietzsche was originally like a progenitor for modernist thinkers, but then becomes a progenitor for postmodern thinkers. Um, do you think we can still call ourselves modern and postmodern at all? Or, or are we completely like you're set, like we're in this new metamodern era? Yeah, so I tend not to use terms modern, postmodern, or metamodern as periodizations. So one of the things in the book, um, one of my earlier books that you mentioned, The Myth of Disenchantment, is I was trying to challenge the very idea that there was a kind of modern rupture, that there was a moment where uh, humans, usually often supposed to be Westerners, uh, had seen reality in some clear and unencumbered way and suddenly became rational, whether people attributed that to the scientific revolution or the enlightenment or, or, or you know, what have you. Uh, I want to argue that that moment never happened. So in a way, I, I'm trying to argue that we were never modern to also gesture to Bruno Latour um, a little bit, um, although I had a very but different, slightly different formulation of my argument than he does, or actually, yeah. Um, and so I want to say that we were kind of, that modern, modernity was always a kind of myth, the, a myth that had certain kind of functions. It had an organizing function producing various kinds of modernization projects that were often parts of colonialism or attempts to transform um, certain kinds of cultures or societies. And But it also functioned as an inspiration in the arts that were competing over the status of which could represent the, the moment of uh, the modern. And, and if just to trace that term way back, it's a medieval term. And so the first group to call itself uh, modern uh, is actually in the late Middle Ages with a contrast between um, uh, basically Gothic um, and uh, Roman architecture. Um, so that term is very mobile, like any moment could, it just means nowness or, you know, the now moment. And right. so, you know, everybody kind of wanted to grab a hold of that term modernism. And there were some, some self-consciously modernist movements, famously modernism in art, um, where people were really um, embracing that category themselves. And I think it's uncontroversial to use modernism to talk about those folks, but I don't think that there was like a vast moment where there was modernity. And then there was another moment called postmodernity. Post and then there's a third moment called metamodernity. Rather, I think that um, in different areas, often uh, in unconnected ways, different groups of folks started calling themselves, let's say modernists or postmodernists or what have you. Uh, and the connection between the arts for instance, and the philosophy was sometimes tenuous and sometimes more or less tight or whatever. Um, and in this respect, um, I think the term postmodernism, uh, as I use it in the book, describes a particular academic paradigm that was gelled together and has the properties that it does because of the way thinkers were anthologized. So when Nietzsche, for example, is put in next to um, Foucault and next to Derrida, uh, it's only certain selections of Nietzsche. Perhaps it's his unpublished essay, Truth and Lies in an Extra Moral Sense. And then when gets from the that anthologizing process that um, polishes out or buffs out often the differences between these different thinkers, you get an idea that they represent something called postmodernism. But if you take Nietzsche and put him in a different context, let's say a literary context, and you put him alongside, um, or, or you know, uh, as the positivists did, they put him in their famous positivist manifesto, they gestured to Nietzsche. The part of Nietzsche they were getting was the critique of religion. So for them, what made Nietzsche the archetypal modernist thinker in, in, in that was another part of his work. And so uh, in that respect, there's a way in which um, when I'm talking about things like modernism or postmodernism, I'm talking about um, various processes that gel together certain constellations of thinkers um, or artistic works, et cetera. So I don't think that we, um, you know, ever were modern. Um, there are just people who were more self-consciously labeled themselves a modernist. And similarly, there were some people, most of the people who get called postmodernists did not themselves think of themselves as postmodernists, but uh, a postmodernist model developed in the academy by selecting bits of them and anthologizing them together. Um, I think I've lost the thread of your original question, but I think where I was going to go was what I'm hoping uh, is that um, I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, that we're in a moment where treating postmodernism as an ideal to be achieved or perhaps an enemy to be disentangled uh, has changed. Uh, but I don't think that there is such a thing as a clean zeitgeist. History, uh, to paraphrase William Gibson, does not happen or the future is not everywhere all at once. Uh, you know, so 
in, in that respect, I think that there, um, you know, there are always people left out of the story of postmodernism, as you know, Cornell West uh, famously noted about, uh, you know, African American artists, many of whom, you know, were excluded and didn't definitionally fit in the category of the postmodern, even when postmodernism was supposed to be the dominant uh, form of culture. A lot of things didn't fit into that, etc. So. Um, yeah, anyway, that's a, a sort of rambling answer to, to sort of denying periodization. Uh, but I'm I'm all for models. Uh, I'm just uh, against periodizing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, and that's fantastic. And um, going back to your, I guess, fight on what postmodernism is conceived as, there are a lot of problems. And, you know, being a literature guy myself, uh, it, it just comes down to to pure slippery relativism and, and you just go on this whole loop. So, um, yeah, and I guess... Metamodernism too, when I first discovered it, it came from, you know, post postmodernism because postmodernism, it was supposed to be the end of the world. And it's like, okay, we're still here. We're, you know, we're in this weird dystopian society and in, in, in ways and in, in aspects now, but you know, so what do we call post postmodernism? And I guess new sincerity was one label. Metamodernism has been the other one. And I think that's just been the dominant one um, that's slipped into more pop culture, especially on YouTube and, 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 you know, public discussion on, on social media. Um, so it's very interesting. So I want to go talk uh, more specifically about what's happening in your book. So in the beginning of the book, you address the longstanding philosophical debate between what is real and what is not real. Um, can you talk a little bit more on how realism uh, may arrive in waves and how they are pre predicated on mind dependent categories and contrast classes uh, like real and you know not real, what the difference between real and exist is? Um, yeah, yeah, totally. So um one way to to talk about the present moment um, um, is that to see various academic disciplines, various philosophical sectors um, as um, uh, split between realists and anti-realists are fighting each other. Um, and what I wanted to argue is that um, a lot of realists and so-called anti-realists are really talking past each other. They have very different ideas about what's at stake. Um, sometimes they're, um, they treat the other as in a radically caricatured way. Uh, they all tend to grant uh, that some version of common sense uh, experience is not actually the case. And then they fight over, uh, you know, various things. It's hard to, it can be hard to identify what it is they're actually fighting over. And what I want to argue in the book is that, or what I argue in the book is that real is a contrasting term that gets most of its mileage off of an implied, but often unstated contrast. So if I say, you know, this is a real T, uh, I might be saying that it is um, not a uh, just a plastic bottle with no liquid in it, or I might be saying uh, this is a real tea, as in it's a Japanese tea, and Japanese teas are like really good as a good tea, uh, you know, authentic or something like that. Or I might be saying uh, this is a real tea, not just a dream of a tea, uh, you know. Or you know, there's a whole range of different things I could be meaning when I say something is you know a real tea. Or I could say this. I could be trying to imply that it exists rather than does it exist. Um, or I could be, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that could be going on when I say that. And often um, when folks get explicit about what they mean by the term real, uh, often what they're talking about is mind dependent or mind independent. So in the case of realism, um, you know, a certain number of self-conscious um, um, philosophical realists think that what we're fighting about is, you know, is there something um, mind independent? And one of the things that I noted as a sort of social scientist is that uh, there's a basic problem there because many of the things that we're most interested in in the humanities and social sciences are made by people. And that means that they're necessarily mind dependent. Um, and then I started to think about how many different ways could a thing be mind dependent? Because mind dependence, uh, for, for as much effort as has gone into arguing um, uh, between realists and anti-realists, there's very, very little about what it would mean for something to be mind dependent. And I started thinking about this a little bit. I thought, you know, there are different ways things could be mind dependent. Like this tea, this bottle could be is mind dependent uh, insofar as humans made this bottle. This bottle wouldn't exist if people hadn't thought it up, if minds hadn't thought it up and put it into existence, et cetera, but it's still a physical object. And if you bang yourself on the head with it, it still hurts. So uh, in that respect, the contrast between mind dependent and existent is probably a mistake. Um, so then you could also note that there are other ways that things could be mind dependent. They could be mind dependent because you might have certain beliefs in your head, like, um, you know, Adam's your favorite um, hip hop artist, for example, that could be mind dependent because that's something that's in your head. But that doesn't mean that uh, that that but that means you can still make true statements about it. So if I were to say um, Adam's favorite hip hop artist is uh, the Coop, 
that would either be a true or false statement, depending on whether that is in fact your hip favorite hip hop artist. So in that respect, it might depend on your mind, but it doesn't depend on my mind. Uh, and so anyway, there's a lot of complications that go into people not theorizing um, what they mean by mind dependence. And I argue that it comes in a bunch of varieties, causal, uh, ontological, classificatory, uh, semiotic, and then kind of global notions of mind dependence. And I explain what those are in more or less detail. And I think by focusing on that, um, we can help get through or get past the naive idea um, naive clashes between realists and anti-realists, and in particular, talking about waves to circle back to the first part of your comment, I noted that there was uh, that there's been this tendency between people people accusing each other of being anti-realists, basically, and then also people who were embracing various kinds of neo-realism and ended up granting most of the things that people thought of as anti-realism. So there's a kind of paradox built into certain things like speculative realism or certain species of critical realism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That could be more or less interesting uh, to your viewers, depending on how deep they are and uh, you know, uh, early to mid two thousands uh, blogger philosophy, <laughs> but uh, but but all that is to say, um, often I think that those uh, uh, conflicts are rooted in uh, a failure to apprehend the way that the term real needs to be understood as a kind of multimodal term, which which gains its knowledge from contrast classes, and I think then we could take a new attitude as. Uh, you know, metamodernists, uh, insofar as uh, people find that term helpful, uh, and by granting that it's not a simple real or not real often, but that we have to be much more careful about what we're meaning by the term real, um, and that there's not one univocal way to be real. Uh, and then this also tips into questions about what it means to exist. And I have a case for a kinds of ontological grounding, different ways that things uh, come into existence, and uh, uh, different ways in that different ways that particular entities existence is dependent on different kinds of features um, of the world. For instance, you know, what it means for an event to exist is that it has to have been a time slice. Uh, whereas what it means for a um, bottle, uh, you know, an object to exist is, is a kind of matter. Matter and time slices are not the same thing, for instance, or what it means, you know, and anyway, we can keep going. So I, I kind of uh, try and theorize in a more nuanced and tight way, not only real as a contrast class, but separating, once we separate real from exist, different ways or modes in which things can exist. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's uh, great for uh, like establishing, um, you gave examples in the book, um, you know, how fictional characters can, you know, exist, but maybe not be real. Um, and I think there's been a lot of uh, video game theory done on that too. Like what, you know, if you have a certain character in a video game, like, do they exist? Well, these set of binary numbers in the order, like that technically is, you know, Eevee or Pikachu, like on your Pokemon game or whatever. So like they can exist in that sense. And then this metamodernism, like structure even adds that further. So, uh, or even prefaces it. Yeah. So, and this whole thing, you start the book out with, with these mind dependent categories. Um, and this, this opens up literally everything else in the book. Um, you know, process social ontology is tied to it. You know, hylosemiotics is, you know, your theory on that. Um, so I'll get through those one at a time because I have a million questions I can stem from right here. Um, but before we keep going with that, um, I want to ask, you mentioned in the book that you're trying to turn theories like postmodern deconstruction on themselves uh, via your metamodern application. And I think that's a very meta way to approach it. Um, but my question for you is, is can you not turn metamodernism theory on itself if it's a theory about turning theories? Um, does that get into a cycle? Um, how is this inversion different from like postmodern deconstruction? And how do you suggest uh, we pull ourselves out of that cycle once we get into it? Those are a lot of it, questions. But. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that it's really important for theories to often for theories to be able to apply to themselves. And but there's a difference between there are ways that things can apply to themselves. There are different kinds of circularity. There's um, what we might call vicious circularity. Uh, we might also talk ab about, uh, for instance, the postmodernism, where if you turn it on itself, it actually destroys itself. So if you decut construct deconstruction, um, you can demolish deconstruction by turning its own techniques onto itself, for instance. Or if you produce a genealogy of genealogy, it undercuts the operation of genealogy. So those are vicious circles. There may be some other circles that are tautologies. In other words, if you turn them on themselves, you're not saying anything new. They're just, you know, you'd get like one equals one plus, you know, one equals one kind of statements. But metamodernism, I want to argue, is a virtuous circle. So if you turn it on itself, which I try and do in the book, and I'm actually trying to be very careful about that, you can apply to the theory uh, to itself. And instead of dissolving it um, or destroying it, uh, it can show you new insights, provide new insights in the theory. So it's like what the metamodernism book is written in a weird, I know this can be annoying way, that it can be read multiple times 
And once you apply it to itself, you can see how, for instance, my social kind theory uh, is itself a social kind. And I talk about that uh, in the book, for instance, or um, I have an orientation toward knowledge uh, called zeteticism, which you can get there by applying uh, zeteticism to itself in, in one way or another. So I, I, I am a big fan of that kind of circularity that I that I think uh, as long as we're clear that of the difference between vicious and virtuous circles. And so I'm a big fan. You know, you think of virtuous circles often like computer programs that are self debugging. You can be caught. You can be in a loop that's destructive. And then when you turn the, the loop in a bad way, it causes the program to crash. But you can also write programs that are self debugging. And the more you turn them on themselves, the better, uh, more refined they get. And that's what I'm hoping to do with metamodernism. Not that it is uh, ever going to be, a, you know, I mean it to be a permanent or final end to things, but rather something that can evolve and change in, in ways to uh, improve itself. So yeah, I think you're right to see that that circularity. Um, and I think of it as a virtue. And I try and hopefully in the metamodernism book, right, you know, one of the weird things about the book, uh, is that it's attempt to do systematic philosophy in an era and amongst a crowd of folks in which that was um, considered not cool, basically, or at least <laughs> considered old fashioned and kind of a little bit suspect. So, um, you know, um, but I, I think it's important to aim for that kind of consistency. And so the pieces kind of fit together. Um, you know, if I have this view of what the world is, I probably should have this view of language or just to focus back on what we were talking about before. If you start from thinking that there are different ways that certain kinds of existence are ontologically grounded, you might want to know, you might want to think, you know, what is it that, you know, grounds fictional characters, as we were talking before, you might think, well, what is it that grounds social kinds or categories? Uh, what is it that makes uh, a socially constructed kind exist? Uh, in other words, instead of treating social construction and realism as opposites, how does social construction make something real? And that then I step off in the next chapter of the book, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in that respect, I was aiming for a kind of self-consistency. And it meant I had to go through the book myself uh, a bunch of times to look for inconsistencies. And I had other people help me, um, you know, I had students read it and, and other colleagues and friends read it. Um, but I'm sure, you know, that one of the other things that I'm committed to is as a, a, a practitioner of humble knowledge, I know I'm wrong about some shit. So we will have to figure out what it yeah. is. Um, but uh, I think that's also part of the reflexive and self-reflexivity that I want to build into this project. So I'm also very aware of myself and my historical uh, and temporal location in the writing of the book and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's part of that um, reflexivity or recursion too. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, so there's a lot, actually, this leads in pretty much perfectly to my next question here, especially in terms of uh, your past research and, and, and mainly when I first stumbled on you, it was metamodernism, but as I went more and more, I, you know, your theories and, and philosophy on history is, is really been what's standing out to me, um, particularly in this book. So I want to ask you about process social ontology here. Um, and that's something that's gained like, you know, buzzword traction lately. Um, in short, you argue that we can and should see the world as an unfolding process or set of processes in order to inform ourselves of natural and social kinds. Is that Roughly correct. Yeah, I'm particularly interested in seeing the social world. So that there are um, process ontologists who are mostly interested in matter and its processual um, processual counts of matter or physical materials and, and natural kinds. People like uh, uh, Alfred North Whitehead, um, and then. There have been social ontologists who are mostly interested in about what causes the social to exist or how does it exist. And in a way, I'm kind of merging those two threads, uh, although right. my my uh, process uh, stuff comes from more um, non-European philosophers uh, specifically rather than Whitehead, although I do some engagement with him. Um, but yeah, so but right. So then I'm interested in how the social world, at least very broadly conceived, because at, at the end of the day, I'm going to argue that many of the boundaries often held up between the social and the natural are themselves artificial for reasons that we could go into. But anyway, I, I want to argue for uh, exactly, as you say, thinking of the social in terms of processes. Yeah, right. Um, so when I read this, I thought it was uh, similar and, you know, I'm a, a big Sartre guy. So it, it was similar to me to Sartre's argument in existentialism as a humanism that human nature can't be judged or determined because we don't know what it is yet. Like human existence hasn't, we've, we haven't gotten to the end um, since it's, you know, also developing. Um, and Sartre argued that this idea calls for humans to make individual decisions as if they were being made on behalf of the entire human race. Um, so I'm wondering if in metamodernism, um, are there any actions uh, or what are the actions that process social and ontology is calling for humans to do if there are any? Yeah, good point. And uh, you're much more deeply in the existential literature than I am. And, um, you know, I, I can only speak slightly to Sartre. Um, but, what, you know, um, I would say um, I think that there are ways in which the um, uh, notion of a 
non-fixed human nature are compatible with a process ontology. But on the other hand, um, as opposed to certain existentialist notions of radical freedom, um, you know, I, I'm, I think more, um, you know, the, the, there's a quite relevant quote of Marx that I'm trying to remember from the 18th Premier, um, something like people make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. So um, in, in that respect, um, uh, what I'm interested in is how both there are social kinds that are often passed down or handed down to us from our peers, from our history, et cetera. Uh, these are process kinds. In other words, they're always changing, but they're not merely, we don't have complete freedom in regard to them necessarily. Uh, we often tend to treat them or, or as if they're universals, as if they're natural kinds. And one of the things that is incumbent, so like, for example, categories like uh, quote unquote race, where people are racialized in various ways uh, that they feel often, um, you know, th this is a way in which I'm responding to uh, the sex another generation of existentialists like Franz Fanon and others, but who are who, who observe that there is, you know, uh, we, there is a kind of freedom that we can claim, um, but uh, nevertheless, we can't deny that this racialization goes on and that it is a significant impact on people's experiences. So as metamodernists, what I want to suggest is that um, we develop both a critical orientation toward our categories in a way that can be freeing. So we learn to see that we have, um, in certain respects, more agency than we thought, but we don't have the kind of complete freedom that some of the existentialists argue for because we don't just make them ourselves. We make them as kind of collective social creatures. And this gives us uh, the opportunity to both uh, struggle to find freedom from the categories that we think of as imprisoning us and chaining us, but also lets us change the properties, reformulate those that we um, find ourselves in in ways that make them more productive, redefine what it means to be, I don't know, a man, quote unquote, say, in the 21st century, or redefine what it means to be um, uh, a global citizen or whatever. These are categories that are handed down, but ones in which I want to argue, especially when we can take collective agency, we can transform in ways that can be really powerful and really important. Uh, and also, I want to emphasize that then, um, unlike in an individualistic, existentialist account of personal freedom, um, I want to emphasize uh, for the importance of collective, community-oriented attempts to produce new kinds and categories and how valuable those are. Like, for instance, new ways of thinking about the world that'll help us um, deal with big problems like anthropogenic climate change, for instance, which, um, you know, there are individual choices going on, but I think we can overemphasize individual atomized choices uh, instead of the importance of collective action if we really want to change the world and um, make things a better place. And so for that reason, uh, I think that the social kinds theory, uh, which I articulate in the metamodernism book, is both, I haven't talked about this part, but it's both better uh, as a way of doing social science, as a way of studying our objects, but it's also better for those of us um, who feel like we want to change the world in some way or another, because it both is a more accurate description of the way the world is. And I think because it also should give us some hope for how we can more productively engage in collective action to um, transform our environment and um, uh, yeah, make the world a better place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so how does this combat uh, maybe more specifically postmodernism um, because they're the current big bad evil guy. Um, so how does this combat postmodernism and what does this provide aside from culturally informed truisms or is it a call for culturally informed truisms in order to combat deconstructionism? Um, and maybe a different question is, does it negate the principles of modernism? I think it's tricky because it's like it's deconstructive, but it's also predicated on what we know to have happened already. We notice the paradigms. Yeah. So in my case, the way that I'm using metamodernism, it's um, I want to I, I think of it as a several step process. It's a kind of therapeutics in a way. And the first step of that process, um, you know, and I think of it as a philosophical therapeutics. I'm gesturing here to, you know, Wittgenstein and others, um, Steve Cavell and others when I'm talking about this. But basically um, what I think you do is you do the deconstructive move first. So in yeah. uh, unlike some uh, old fashioned um modern, you know, still die in the wool modernists or, you know, as they often call themselves these days, neo-enlighteners or whatever, like the Stephen yeah. Pinkers <laughs> of the world who want to just say postmodernism all bad. You know, it, we we hate it. It was terrible. Don't even take it seriously. Unlike those guys, I want to say, actually, yes, uh, the deconstructive move is important, but we just can't terminate in the deconstructive move. Why? Because if you only do deconstruction, you end up um, not only does deconstruction undercut itself, but also uh, if your motivation for doing deconstruction is broadly speaking, ethical or political or even a 
epistemological, uh, all of those lead toward dead ends if you only stall in the negative. So, you know, you identify all the stuff that's fucked up about the world. You identify all the things that are broken, uh, all the things that can be and need to be deconstructed. And that's the first step. And I, you know, in my book, I have a whole chapter, you know, that where we do that kind of, I teach a new, uh, like a deconstructive dojo, uh, a way of destroying categories and concepts. But then out the other side of that, having deconstructed deconstruction, if you will, uh, we then move on to a place where we can create new categories with a new kind of humility. Um, unlike uh, an older, let's say modernist or um, enlightenment theorizers who thought, hey, you know, they could finally see the world in an unclouded way, you know, like this is the moment where, you know, the sparkling clarity of rationality was supposed to, you know, discover all the truths or whatever. Um, so the postmodernists showed that those guys were wrong. Yes, they were wrong, but uh, the postmodernists were also wrong insofar as they themselves can be provincialized and located in a particular moment. And so then we, uh, as um, metamodernistas, uh, if you will, um, can work uh, with and, and work going forward with a kind of humble knowledge, but it's a humble knowledge within the horizon of history. So unlike the modernists and uh, ironically the postmodernists as well, both of them end up ended up arguing for themselves as the ends of history in one way or another. And we note that we are within history, and in that respect, we historicize ourselves. And so we use these certain kinds of techniques, even if we notice that in the longer durée of historical time, the hope is that we ourselves will be eventually eclipsed. I don't think we need to be eclipsed yet. We got a lot more work to do. We got a lot yeah. more ways to transform the conversation and make it a better place. But I think we, in, rather than, um, but yeah, so I think, but I think that that deconstructive movement is important uh, and it has some true insights. It's just, uh, we can't terminate in the negative or to borrow, you know, Zizek's reformulation of Hegel. We don't want to tarry in the negative. Uh, we want to, uh, we want to start from the negative and then work forward. And so this is also true when we think about history too. You know, we, this isn't some of the neo enlighteners want to say, okay, you know, um, uh, European history is great and it was always awesome, basically. Uh, the postmodernists were kind of like, yeah, no, uh, history was fucked up, uh, but then they don't, you know. And what we want to say is, yes, history was fucked up, but there were these little glimmers, these little seeds of things that we might want to hold on to and pull forward. So we both don't deny the screwed upness of history. Uh, and we often note um, that the screwed upness of history is one of the things that we have to work to struggle to overcome. But if we want to do that, uh, we have to work hard. We have to both be uh, have our eyes open to how it was screwed up, but also uh, begin to think about how we might improve things and, and make things better for a whole bunch of folk. So that's the other part of the project too. So it has that kind of positive oriented, uh, constructive side to it on the other side of the deconstruction. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a pretty big, maybe obvious thing. I, I might've missed just asking you this now, like I really enjoy the idea of starting with the deconstruction because you have to do that to apply modernism in term. I think I just took that for granted. So yeah, that's fantastic. So what about you? What have you used? metamodernism for yeah right so in my own work um i've used primarily the uh your writings on mind dependent work um in relation with performance theory so uh hmm. rebecca uh schneider and richard schneckner their work on temporality in live performance um hmm. and i argue that reading itself is a performance if we start looking at like uh looking at reading as, as a temporal process, it's, it's something you're going through, um, and we're applying metamodern, uh, you know, mind dependent categories to it. You can really pin down where your interpretations are coming from, where they're landing, how everything's being processed. Um, so a quick rundown is, is, you know, first I'll take the performance theory and I argue that reading is a performance and that there's two, um, classes so you know it's it's the audience and the uh performers the performers are actually performing but the audience is doing their own performance they have to take in the information and use you know mind dependent categories to take in um whatever information is physically or you know uh sonically presented to them so if you go see Le Mes, for example uh you have a big styrofoam ship on stage or mm. uh you know and, and some guy in a, a half you know put on beard uh, you're you as the audience member, you're asked to believe that you're in a shipyard and Javert is is yelling at this real man um, who's not just, you know, a handsomely paid actor. He's this ragged, you know, prisoner for whatever. So that happens in theater. And that's what happens with mind dependence there. It's like how the audience is performing to themselves, like what you're taking from the source material and taking to yourself and, uh, to yourself and processing it. Um, and then when you're applying that to reading, well, you don't have anyone on stage. Uh, so, okay, so they're not the performers. And then 
how about the text itself? Well, the text is is stagnant and the text is its own thing. Um, and then you you go through different categories. So like, well, how about the author? Is the author the performer? And you're like, no, well, because Tennessee Williams can write a streetcar named Desire, but you don't go see Tennessee Williams. You go see a streetcar named Desire. So the author is in their own other class there. They're just a progenitor. Um, so what that really means is that the reader both acts as performer and audience to themselves and when you're reading uh and you're you're taking things in uh and i go through and i, I describe each you know classificatorily um you know ontologically what the process and and other things about reading mm. a book are so if you're reading a newspaper you're going to be informed in a certain way if you're reading a book another way mm. an internet article another way a kid's book another way um and so i go through all that pretty extensively so metamodern has been huge in that um, and I'm working on applying a lot more um, STEM-oriented, right brain, left brain statistics to that process. So where would that happen? Mm -hmm. um, and then the final example I'll give is I, I gave an example on Lolita, and uh, it's it, you know my favorite book of all time. And mm -hmm. uh, it's the scene when um, Humbert and Claire Quilty are wrestling, and they become essentially one person. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, there's goat imagery. Ex uh, you know, exemplified and, mm. and baby imagery uh, written in there. So you could read it as one thing and then walk away. You know, there's a temporal difference. You can walk away and be like, oh man, that's crazy that this baby and goat morphed into this, you know, same being and stumbled downstairs. And like, that didn't happen, but that's just how your mind processed it. And it's defined by mm. these mind dependent categories and the temporal processing. Um, so yeah, that's how in, in, in long- That sounds cool, yeah. Yeah, that I'm very awesome. passionate about it. It's it's really cool. So um hopefully we'll that's in the works of getting published there. So it's, it's awesome. Yeah, let me shoot out. let me know when it comes out. I'd be, yeah, curious to read it for sure. Absolutely. Um, all right. So that's my pseudo question there. Um, I actually do have one more question for you, and, and maybe I'll tack this one on as well. Yeah. Uh, what what to you does it mean uh to be, I don't know how often you get asked this, uh, but a working philosopher in, in America today and in, in modern times in the age of the internet and everything, um, putting out this, this, you know, application theory and, and especially in the predominant critical theory culture we're in, what, what does that all mean to you? Hmm. It's a good question. Um, I mean, I think that they're, that they're, every particular moment and context has its own challenges and its own opportunities. And I think, one of the things that I really love in our, you know, um, contemporary moment is, you know, the capacity to reach out to folks via mediums like Zoom, you know, like I'm giving talks um, all over the globe in ways that in would be very hard or at least very um, uh, uh, detrimental to the environment and require a lot of flights or whatever uh, in another era. So I think I, on the one hand, there's a new opportunity, you know, like I'm giving a talk in London, talk in Paris and a talk in London just in the next couple of weeks, um, both on Zoom. Um, and so, and, and I was talking to folks in Australia a few days ago and, you know, th just things like that. Um, so I think that's, that gives it a new opportunity to kind of be a public, to have public conversations, to have interactions with people in new ways. I love podcasting. Um, I spend a lot of time doing podcast interviews and I also listen to a lot of podcasts when I jog. I'm, I often have a podcast going um, and I uh, just enjoy that uh, or when I'm driving around. Um, so, I mean, I think that those are some of the particularities of the moment that I find positive. There are other things that are challenging. The, you know, contemporary um, status of the academy. The academy's in a lot of trouble right now. It's There's a lot of precarity. A lot of people um, don't have jobs or their jobs might vanish. I think that the tip toward even um, mere, the merely sort of defending STEM for some reason, uh, as opposed to understanding the importance of a broader mission in the academy. Um, you know, I think that that's, uh, that's really challenging because, um, you know, yeah, I, I really feel that the academy is under threat and I can, uh, one of the things that I hope metamodernism does is try to remedy some of those issues, um, on a intellectual level, but it really needs to also happen on a structural level, on a jobs level on all these other levels. Um, and I think one of the side effects of increasing inequality in our contemporary society, uh, is that there's less money and less resources available for a lot of folk and a lot of different things. Um, you know, we're also living in a moment where, you know, with, where, Climate change and and um, uh, issues, racial justice issues, uh, are all front and center um, in our public discourse. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff happening, um, and some good and some bad. And so, you know, I think you know when I compare myself to 
you know, uh, other philosophers of an earlier generation, you know, what, what were Derrida and company going through? They were reacting to, uh, you know, the failures of 1968 in France and then the Vietnam War and the rise of Thatcher and uh, then, you know, figures like Reagan, et cetera. Um, so, you know, um, it's, yeah, I don't know, every every epoch has its own struggles. Um, yeah, it's it can, I think probably we'll only know outside, you know, like some future historian writing about this moment will have clear insights into the moment, perhaps than those of us living through it, um, or at least have different, more generalizable insights. Uh, da, da, da. I don't know if that answers your question. That's sort of a, a yeah. What, is there anything other, other aspects of that? Yeah. It does. Um, and I guess I'm always so curious um, who the big philosophers of the day are. And I think right now, probably the most, I, I'd say, pop culture, like just giant is, is Zizek. Um, cause he's just been on, you know, like from vice to, you know, his short clip memes that people just, you know, he's, he's become a very comedic figure at the same time. And I, I think that's helped his ideas spread a lot more. Um, so, but then, you know, you have people like, uh, Jordan Peterson, who a lot of people, you know, large population consider a philosopher and, and you know, that's obviously a contentious take there. Um, and so it, it's very curious to see what the working philosophers are like versus what the public philosophers are like, um, where they meet and where they're headed, where, you know, the information, the real information goes, where, I, I don't know, it's just, it's it's very interesting landscape to me. It's something I always keep an eye on. Um, so I, I don't know. Yeah, I think from my perspective, on that. yeah, so from my perspective, like, um, you know, there's a, you're right that there's a big disconnect between who is in the public eye versus who academic philosophers are reading and talking about. Like, for instance, Jordan Peterson is a great example. Most philosophers don't take him seriously at all as a philosopher, but he has such a huge following um, among particularly right leaning folk in the contemporary United States. Um, Zizek is another example where Zizek's first big book in English, The Sublime Object of Ideology, you know, was a good uh, book got a lot of traction and you know people took his interpretation of um you know ideology itself is quite useful but then he's he's kind of re reiterates stuff and he gets sort of sillier and he uh, and i think um i i would my sense is that a, a lot of fo a lot of my fellow um scholars don't take him very seriously beyond that book. Do you know what I mean? And even though I think he's huge in the public eye, he's an incredibly entertaining figure. And I've, I've seen him speak a couple of times and he's, you know, like a stand-up comedian. I mean, he's, he's, he's awkward in a really appealing way that makes him really fun to watch. So, uh, but I think that, you know, or there, there's this, but there's even worse. And I, you know, um, uh, you know, so, I mean, in a way he's a kind of popularization. Uh, I don't know that his work is necessarily super serious, but in, what's worse is that a lot of the space of public intellectual is taken up by economists and psychologists in one way or another. So, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, Steven Pinker, again, who, you know, for whatever his merits as a um, psychologist around focusing on issues of language, he uh, really like has very naive things to say about, I don't know, the history of the enlightenment or the, you know, angels of our better nature and whatever, whatever. And he sucks up a lot of the air or even worse, you get economists pontificating about shit in, you know, in big cultural ways. Um, and their presuppositions are very heavily determined by um, the background of contemporary economic theory, which is very bizarre. I mean, it's very bizarre, the cultural prestige of economics, given that they fail to predict mostly everything. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, economic crashes are very regular. So um, so for that reason, I mean, I think there's also a contrast K class between, you know, or contrast we might note between the Anglophone world, you know, in in, in France, uh, there's more of a status for certain kinds of public intellectuals, although many of them are artists and writers at this particular moment, rather than philosophers. Um, whereas in the U.S., yeah, it's economists and psychologists and then people wielding vaguely the prestige of STEM, like uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, who's an engineer, yep. not really even a science guy. I mean, I liked this stuff as a, when I was younger, but like he's not really a scientist even. So, I mean, he's just a kind of popularizer. And I don't actively dislike him, but it's just he gets way too much air uh, given, um, you know, he's not a very particularly original thinker and, you know, I, I, he's not even a scientist. So um, I guess, you know, Bill Nye, the engineer just didn't, you know, didn't rhyme well enough or whatever, but the, the children yeah. Entertainer, yeah. yeah, the children entertainer, you yeah. know, so I think that that's one challenge of our moment. And, but, and one of the things that I struggle with is that I'm not very good at sound biteable things. So, um, you know, the, the Twitters of the world, some people have, have built phenomenal careers. I have a, a Twitter, 
uh, friend, uh, Liam Kofi Bright, he's really good at these short Twittery things that are very witty and entertaining. And he's um, the right balance of self-deprecation and philosophy. I don't think um, I can, I can boil my shit down to something like that. And I don't know if I even want to, because I don't like that level of often things have to be very heavily dumbed down in order to do that. So I think things can go viral very quickly, but often by the time they've gone viral, they've been abbreviated and reduced to something that means, you know, super general or is, you know, kind of junk by the time it becomes even self-refuting in ways that are unhelpful. So I don't know, it's, it's a different set of challenges. Um, and in terms of trends, I think that there's one small version of what's happening in philosophy departments in the United States. And then there's a much, and, and they're basically getting more and more specialized in ways that are less and less helpful and have been uh, basically since the 1960s. On the other hand, there are a lot of people doing theory, but it's clear at the moment that there are no, the, the older postmodernism has faded, but it's completely unclear what's going to replace it. And so um, mostly, you know, if I, if I, when I talk to graduate students or junior people, um, they're, there's there's a sense of a fragmented landscape where people are are reading very different things and um are uh not necessarily conversing with each other very well so th i think that's a shame too yeah yeah well it's interesting and i guess um because when i approached this interview to me you're, you're right there's a lot of confusion about what's coming next in, in theory um especially in the humanities being in the humanities there's so much like okay hey, what are we all doing right now we're all doing our own things but like what are we you know what's happening in the world right now there's no uh cohesion and um you know like i mentioned earlier uh like postmodernism was supposed to be the end all be all and we're still here so post postmodernism happened that's not catchy and then metamodernism happened um and you know there's a youtube video that went up the other day uh, i think i had also mentioned this um you know it's a 40 minute thing uh, a video called why do movies feel different now and it's about metamodernism. And hmm. it, you know, I, I think it actually cites you. It cites uh Timotheus and uh Vermoulin and Robin Van Den Acker. Um, it it's popular. So to me, I I'm young. I, you know, I'm I'm 24. I haven't been around to see how the academic, you know, cycles and textbooks actually work. Um, but from an outside perspective for me, you're like the guy when you look at metamodernism, which is is becoming so, so rapidly popular. It's such a buzzword right now. And it's going to stick around. It's just it's catching on. And it's been catching on for the past two years. I've just seen it go and go and go. Um, like your book to me, it, it, I predict it's just going to be around. You go to the metamodern wiki uh, wiki page. It's it's Okadiji. It's it's for Moulin and Van Den Acker. And it's you. And yeah, you, you have the textbook. And that's like where the landscape is. And then, you know, um, Vermoulin and, and Van Den Acker, they have uh, notes on metamodernism and, and, you know, their specific essays and stuff. But an actual applicable system is, is like that's your creation. So that that's insane to me. And I, I feel like that's going to be, you know, you're in the ground zero. You're on the cutting edge here with this stuff. Oh, thank you, and and I appreciate that. And I, my sense is that metamodernism is increasing. I think you're right. I, I hope that that trend continues. It's hard to know, you know. So, yeah. Um, but I've been really delighted at the reception, and I think it's been biggest even in terms of my specific version of it in the Spanish speaking world. And so now that the Spanish translation is on its way out, um, I hope that that will even you know um, amplify even even more concretely that um. Which is great too, because um, you know that's a huge, huge part of the world. Um, yeah, so I don't know, but how, how things will go, I can hope. You know, it's I, I wanted to, you know, it's exciting to get things out there, and I'm sure that other things will come, um, and some of them will build off of it, and some of them will argue with it. So we'll see. But uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, last question, because I forgot to ask this um, first round. But hmm. um, is there anything you'd like to promote coming up? Uh, not specifically. I mean, I have another book, um, in progress, but it's, it's sort of on the, on the philosophy of history stuff. Um, it's called, uh, the genealogy of genealogy, um, which is, you know, turning genealogy on itself. Um, it's my engagement with Foucault most specifically and Nietzsche. Um, but it's still a little ways out. I'm in the closing in on the f first draft um of the whole book but it'll get peer reviewed and i'll get friends to read it and stuff like that so i think it'll be a little i'm just starting a sabbatical this year which is exciting i haven't had a sabbatical for a little while um 
and I'll be um, kind of working on it and finishing off. So that's more than a year out, probably. Maybe, maybe in like if it if the turnaround were as fast as possible, it'd be out in a year. But it's more likely going to be like a year and a half or two. So I don't have anything, yeah, active other than the meta monitors and book itself and er earlier stuff. Yeah, I mean, I'm giving a lot of talks, but uh, people, you know, I'll, I'll tweet about them or people will find them. Um, some of them will be on Zoom and some of them are going to be in person. I'm doing a sort of European tour in the fall. Um, so I'll be doing talks in uh, Germany, uh, Belgium, Denmark, uh, and Spain, and hopefully France as well. Um, but wow. uh, th that'll all kind of come out, um, yeah, a little bit later. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so I this book, again, uh, I've said this has been my Bible for like the past two years on my graduate studies. <laughs> um, I recommend everyone buy it read it, read it again, read it again, um, eat it up. I have one last question for you. Um, and I can talk about so much because this book is so packed and it's just every page is just fantastic. And I feel like I could have an hour long conversation about every chapter, um, but we'll wrap it up here. So um, this may be an open-ended question for an open-ended answer, but I want to know how you see metamodernism being used in academia or the public in the future. Yeah. Well, so I've been really delighted at the way the book has been received so far. And um, a lot of people both in and outside of the Academy have been reaching out to me um, to express their appreciation for it. And um, it's being now translated into three different languages. So uh, it'll be coming out in Spanish, um, Chinese and Vietnamese, and uh, hopefully most of those in the next year or so. Um, and uh, hopefully other languages in the pipeline. Uh, so a lot of one of the things that I just you know I I know is that it's going to be used by people in ways that I don't anticipate, and I think I take a lot of pleasure out of that. Um, what I've what I see um, is uh, already within an academic context, people using different parts of it uh, for their respective projects. People using the social kinds theory, uh, the process social ontology, to do better. I had a sociologist who wants to you know use it for better sociology or something like that, um, just to you know understand social movements better, for instance. Or um, I have folks who are interested in the hylosemiotics, which um, you know the kind of account of meaning in the book, uh, and are very interested in uh, thinking in new ways about animal communication or thinking in new ways is about understanding literature. Um, and, you know, so I, I, those are doors that are, you know, opening. Um, and I've also had a strong response from activists and others who like the formulation of a kind of revolutionary happiness at the end of the book, where I kind of call for bringing, and this is perhaps the least innovative part of the book, but I think it, I'm, I'm, I'm like kind of taking two things that already exist and mixing them together, but uh, basically critical theory and um, virtue ethics and calling for a kind of um, revolutionary happiness as a multi-species flourishing and as a kind of goal and drawing Drawing on significant movements in um, non-European philosophical thought, the writings of figures like Shantideva and Confucius and others, and people uh, in, in activist spaces uh, have come and talked to me about the value of those as kind of positive projects and ways of more positively thinking about, you know, what we might do on the other side of fixing some of the issues that are facing our society today. But, you know, I don't want to overdetermine. I think there, there was also one artist who was doing some interestingly um, abstract art with, you know, where uh, he he referred to, to my book in, in the titles of a couple of his works. Um, but I don't know, like, I, I hope if it's to live, if the project is to grow, it, uh, other people will pick it up and use it in ways I can't imagine. And I'm excited to see that. And I've been delighted at the kinds of things that, that have happened already so far with the book. And I don't want to overdetermine where it goes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, Jason, thank you so much. Um, sure. I, this has just been huge for me. You've been very kind through this whole thing. And thank you so much for taking the time to just answer my questions. Um, yeah. And we'll leave sure. it there. Again, it's uh, Metamodernism, The Future of Theory by Jason Storm. Um, check it out. Read it, read it, read it again and read it again. Um, thank you so much. Thanks. It's a pleasure.